Let's see, I think we're at 10.02, so I think probably we're gonna get going. So good morning from California. Uh, my name is David Amadi, I'm the president of Ridge and I'll be, it'll be my pleasure to moderate today's tasting. I'm coming to you from my dining room, somewhere in the Santa Cruz mountains. Uh, happy to be with you. I'd like to officially welcome you to Ridge Vineyard Spring 2022 virtual tasting. And as, uh, as the name would give you the sense, we're going to be tasting our 2022 spring release today. Uh, we conducted our first virtual tasting about 11 years ago, so I'd like to welcome many of you back. Uh, for those of you who had joined us over the years, uh, we hope you enjoy the next 45 or 50 minutes. And we'd also, also of course, like to welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time to a Ridge virtual tasting, and hopefully you'll be joining for um, joining us for many more into the future. Um, well, we were certainly innovators when we launched this 11 years ago, the virtual tasting. Uh, we continued to innovate last year when we started to use the 187 ml tasting packs, uh, which were very helpful in the midst of COVID. So for today, today's tasting, we have again distributed more than 700 tasting kits containing uh, the vials with the six wines we'll be tasting today. So hopefully you've had an opportunity to pour the wines out on the tasting mats. Uh, that looks something like this. And then uh, you've been able to open the beautiful kit with all the wines inside. I'll show it because I just think it's so gorgeous. They've done such a nice job with this. So hopefully everyone's got one of these out in front of them. So the wines today, tasting order, uh, the six wines, we'll start with the 2020 Estate Chardonnay. Uh, then we'll go to the 2020 Three Valleys. Then we'll do two Zinfandels, the 2020 Paso Robles, and then the 2020 East Bench, followed by the 2020 Geyserville, and then we'll finish off with the 29 Estate Cabernet. Uh, now a little Zoom housekeeping for everybody. It looks like a lot of you are pretty adept at using the chat function, so we encourage you to use that to uh, chat amongst yourself, let us know where you're at, uh, how things are going for you. So please continue to do that. If you have any questions, do show up there. We have uh, Ridge personnel uh, watching that and certainly be answering questions, but we would really like to encourage you to submit your questions using Q&A and all of those questions will get passed through to our panel uh, to answer. So that adds a lot of energy and vitality to the tasting. So we do, do encourage those uh, questions. Uh, also a reminder, uh, there's a social media hashtag for today's event, it's uh, hashtag Ridge Virtual. Ridge Virtual, so whatever it is, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever you'd like to post on, please do. Uh, photos of you tasting and your group tasting would be terrific, we'd love to see you all. Uh, and then uh, Murphy, maybe you can throw that hashtag into the chat so everybody can, uh, can make sure they get that correct. Uh, just a couple of notes. Uh, Ridge was founded in 1962, so this year we are celebrating our 60th anniversaries. So we invite you to follow along with all the celebration uh, throughout this year um, at uh, ridgewine.com uh, forward slash ridge60. Uh, and again, Murphy, maybe you can throw that into the chat so everybody can see that. As part of the celebration, we reached out to our consumers and asked them to share their stories about their experiences with Ridge over the years. And we've just been overwhelmed with dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of stories from folks who had uh, meaningful moments with Ridge uh, throughout their lives. And all of those stories are getting posted up on the website. But we also know that many of you out there have had, um, you know, have represented Ridge for, for perhaps even decades. And we'd love to hear your stories about Ridge and how Ridge is uh, interacted with you in your life. So if you could send your stories along, we'd be more than excited to post those on our, on the website as well. So please send those uh, stories about uh, your experience with Ridge to wholesale at ridgewine.com, wholesale at ridgewine.com. And again, Murphy, I'll, I'll call on you again to maybe drop that email address into the chat so people can then take advantage of that. We'd love to hear from you. Um, as uh, was mentioned in the chat early on. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Uh, I also wanted to take a brief moment to speak about some of our sustainability efforts. We could literally spend hours on this, but just a couple of recent highlights that, uh, that we feel are important to share at this point. So after really feeling the direct impact of climate change over the 
past decade through drought and wildfires, uh, we as an organization knew we had to sort of really to sit on the sidelines here that we needed to take action and we needed to provide leadership on this issue of carbon reduction. So last year we joined IWCA, which is International Wine Race for Climate Action. Uh, as part of that, uh, well, IWCA's mission is really is a it's a group of environmentally committed wineries taking a science-based approach to reducing carbon. Uh, and as a member, you need to complete an audited survey of the winery's greenhouse gas emissions, and you do that every two years. It's an audited uh, survey, and you also need to commit to reduce your emissions by 50% by 2030, and then by 100% by 2050. So that's uh, some of the stuff that's going on in terms of sustainability we wanted to share this morning with you. At this point, I want to actually kick it over to John Olney and uh, ask me added a new team member at Montebello, an important member, and I wanted to give John an opportunity to, to talk a little bit about Trester. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, yeah, about a little over a year ago in January of 2021, after many years of making wine um, <clears throat> up here in Healdsburg at our Lytton Springs facility, um, I took over as head winemaker for both of our wineries, uh, Montebello and Lytton Springs. And, um, you know, it, it became pretty clear that uh, it was, uh, you know, um, a, a, a pretty big task to take on. And I knew uh, I was going to need uh, some help. So uh, we started looking for a winemaker um, for Montebello and um, finally did find one at the end of uh, 2021. And it's Trester Getting who joined us um, just this past January. And Trester was most recently the winemaker at Bialy Vineyards. Um, so, you know, certainly someone who checks off the box of having uh, a lot of experience in Zinfandel. But prior to that, he had also um, worked with a lot of Mountain Cabernet in Napa. So he was just, uh, you know, seemed like an ideal fit. And, um, we're really happy to uh, have him on board. Great, thank you for that, John. And I, let me, I should introduce you. I, I should have done that first, my apologies, but no. John, obviously for those who don't know is our head winemaker and is in charge of both of our production facilities at Lytton Springs and at Montebello and has uh, had a long uh, long career at Ridge, uh, you know, getting close to 25 years now. So thank you for joining us today, John. And our other panelist is David Gates, who's our head of our vineyards and uh, uh, has been with Ridge for, is this 36 vintages coming up, David? I, you, you have you lost count, I have. Get it, getting ahead of yourself a little bit, 34. 34 years, so 34 vintage, vintage or 34th vintage coming up. So David- If, if uh, I make it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm starting to get that same feeling. But uh, uh, yeah, so David is in charge of all of our state vineyards and as well as our, all of our outside growers. And thank you for joining us today. So. With that uh, uh, taken care of, I think it's time to start tasting some wines. And I, the, the first wine in our lineup is the 2020 uh, Estate Chardonnay. And uh, John, maybe I'll ask you to take it off. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so our first wine is uh, the 2020 um, Chardonnay uh, from uh, the Montebello Vineyard. It's our Estate Chardonnay. And uh, you know, 2020 uh, across the board was uh, a relatively uh, low yielding vintage. Um, so we had a lot of concentration in the grapes uh, from the get go. You know, and I, I really, we were just commenting before we got started here. That the 2020 is, is, there's just a beautiful kind of elegance to the wine um, this year. And I, I think a lot of that comes from its it's an interesting, David can um, speak better to it than I can, but um, our Chardonnay is primarily comes from the lower elevations and it's a little counterintuitive, but it's actually a little warmer down at those elevations um, and we're much more exposed straight to the east. So uh, as soon as the sun comes up, we're getting full uh, sunshine. And so we get plenty of ripeness in the grapes and we, we always, it's a little bit of sort of walking that, that fine line of having uh, a wine that has that varietal character of Chardonnay, but maintains um, a, certain, a certain lightness. It's not heavy on the palate. 
Um, and we also benefit uh, being in the Santa Cruz Mountains uh, at elevation and fairly close to the Pacific Ocean um, with generally cooler temperatures, which allows us to maintain that natural acidity. So I think it's a real, um, you know, I think we're really happy with the, uh, the 2020 Escape Chardonnay. It's uh, showing beautifully even at this young, uh, at this young stage. David, you want to you, you want to comment a little bit on the yeah maybe a little more on the growing season and yeah absolutely so yeah twenty twenty um, actually uh, twenty twenty two is shaping up a little bit like twenty twenty in terms of um, lots of rain in the winter um, early December and then very dry January February uh, but what saved us in twenty twenty was in March and April we got uh, about six or seven inches of rain and likewise. Um, well, we, we'll talk about 2022 later, but that's kind of what's happened this year too. Um, what, what those late spring rains do is um, they're basically all that water is available to the vine. So despite the very dry midwinter, um, they, they had enough um, moisture in the soil to kind of get them through. And the, the beauty of the, you know, there's an ocean of Chardonnay in California and some of it really good. Um, the beauty to me of the Santa Cruz Mountains is it, 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 like John says, it walks that fine line of that, I always call it the, the California sunshine, you know, the ripe fruit characters of Chardonnay in the glass, but it always has this beautiful acidity that keeps it fresh and lively. And that is, that's true, you know, throughout the Appalachian, it's, it's a great place for Chardonnay and it's a very versatile, a very adaptable grape too. It can grow on either side of the San Andreas Fault. It does really well at our, at our elevations where it gets a little bit of the um, influence from our inversion layer that sits up over the bay. And so that keeps it nice and cool in the, at, at night and, um, and during the early morning. And as John said, the, uh, mo the, our, some of our better blocks are, they face east and um, they get all that morning sun. And, um, and they're also, as you know, Chardonnay loves limestone and the, our best blocks are, are, have their roots down into the limestone that we have here at Montebello, that we're lucky to have here at Montebello. Yeah, talk, talk about how those locations were selected for planting, David. Obviously, there were the specific areas that you wanted to plant Chardonnay in when, uh, when, when they went in. I'm hoping, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing because, you know, it, that's kind of... Um, California viticulture in a nutshell, it would, which would kind of describe um, Chardonnay at, at Montebello. So first we, they just, um, and this was, um, it, it came with, a, with our property. This is a wine that we've been making since 1962. So up at the Torre Vineyard, which is where our tasting room is, there, there are a couple acres of Chardonnay, uh, 14 or so acres of Cabernet Sauvignon, and one acre of, of um, Ruby Cabernet planted in 1949. Uh, they chose those because um, you know you could you could get that wood and well the Ruby Cabernet was that was a favor that uh, William Short did with uh, uh, Howard Omo or Harold Omo that who um, bred the vine but um, the Chardonnay was planted just because that was a white grape that you could grow and there wasn't a lot of it back then in California. At, at down at Jim Samer, which we also call the Klein Vineyard, um, when when the um, owners there started planting grapes with Ridge's help, um, they we wanted to plant a little wanted to plant a little bit of Chardonnay along with the uh, Cabernet and Zinfandel, and so they just took the the next blocks that were available, and they happened to be in a really nice spot for Chardonnay. As uh, we've worked with those vineyards for thirty and forty years we kind of learned that that is kind of the sweet spot for Chard. You get it, we can grow Chardonnay at our higher elevations, uh, but it's a little bit different. Um, it, it tends to ha have less of the overt fruitiness that we get when it's sitting in the inversion layer in the fog, but it's much more mineral and structured. And so it's a great combination. So you, you basically throw spaghetti on the wall, see what sticks, and then you can, um, you can go from there as you're doing replanting and whatnot. So that that's kind of <laughs> as a long answer to a short question, I guess. No, Not much planning, but a little bit more now, I think. But yeah. 
<laughs> I guess where I was leading you towards though, David, was where, where it's planted, was it chosen because of the exposure to limestone? Was one of that, was that one of the key factors in terms of particularly at the lower lower elevation sites? Was that a factor? So, yeah, so those, those first plantings in the 80s, no. Um, but the plantings that we did in the 2000s at the Rooston Ranch, yes. And so we had a little section um, that uh, we're really happy with um, that, that is a little more of an east and north exposure and it is um, sitting in some limestone and that those wines um, have been making the Montebello Chardonnay. Um, they've done really well. We've also been playing around with some clones, um, but that's, you know, that's, that's what we like to do in the vineyard. Yeah. I have one of these a question on my sheet here, which is is kind of an interesting but silly question. Is like, you know, is this a new age cool climate style Chardonnay? But I mean, it's a wine we've been making since 1962. So is it sort of back to the future? Is that what it is? Well, you know, fashion, fashion like um, <laughs> like everything is cyclical, right? <laughs> and so yeah, <laughs> if you if you're successful as a winery for a long enough time, then all of a sudden you're new again. So I don't know, I. I, I think it goes back to Santa Cruz Mountains is a great place for Chardonnay because it shows everything off that you want. Uh, if you like kind of the riper style, but it always finishes with that great acidity and that's what keeps it fresh and lively. So, you know, that, that, that's, and that, that's kind of my take on it. Okay. And in terms of availability, this is, you know, slightly more than the 19, but still a very limited availability for Chardonnay. Um, we are always asked, David, about new plantings of Chardonnay. Is there anything, anything on the drying board? Um, we, we butted over a little half, a couple acres of Merlot at elevation up at our Peroni vineyard um, that was in a swale to Chardonnay. And that is, that's showing some good promise. Um, it's not a lot, uh, but we're, we have some more um, open space land that we are developing and, and it's on the, it's on the, uh, it's on the table, but it's not, you know, it's kind of more facing west and, and less um, and south. And so that might not be ideal for Chardonnay. Great for the Petit Verdot and Cabernet. Okay, well, good. All right. Well, I think we're officially kicked off here and ready to move to wine number two, which is our three valleys, um, which I think is affectionately referred to as our, our, our one winemaker's wine or winemaking wine. So if you don't agree, maybe I'll ask you to kick it off then. Sure. So yes, yeah, so the Three Valleys um, is, is different or differentiates itself from all of our other wines um, because it's the one wine that is not a single vineyard wine. Um, it's instead a wine which is made up of um, many different lots from many uh, of our vineyards throughout <clears throat> Sonoma County. Um, you know, but it's, it's, so that's how it's different, but it, it's actually the same or it's a product of the main, um, the main way that we, we go about winemaking at Ridge, which is um, through the selection process. So regardless of what the vineyard is, we could take uh, Litton Springs, for example, um, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be, uh, harvesting that in individual blocks as each one, uh, gets ripe. So at the end of harvest, we'll have, we could have as many as 35 to 40 different <clears throat> tanks with, from different blocks of the vineyard. And as soon as malolactic is complete, usually around the turn of the year, uh, we'll start tasting these and evaluating them. Um, we're tasting them blind. I mean, we know this is all from Linton Springs, but we start selecting out whichever of the blocks we think best represent uh, the vineyard and are going to make the best uh, wine, the best Linton Springs in that year. And there's always 10, 15 percent um, of the wines which are very good, but maybe they're just lacking a little something. Maybe there's not quite enough acidity. Um, maybe there's, uh, maybe it didn't get quite as ripe as we wanted it to. So those wines, we then start to assemble and that's how we make, um, how we make the three valleys. And, um, you know, it, it, it you know, it, and it is sort of our winemakers wine in the sense that rather than simply <clears throat> limiting ourselves to one specific plot of ground, um, 
and sort of letting the, the, the wine, the grapes express themselves without much intervention on our part. Here, we, we, this, is, this is direct intervention. We're taking this block and we're, we're gonna, you know, I could, I could decide to bring over some Petite Syrah because I think it needs a little more color. So it's a little more of, uh, you know, mixing and matching um, and much more of a, uh, you know, we're much more involved in sort of determining uh, the style uh, of the wine in any given, in any given year. Um, you know, and, and we, and, you know, the, the, the overarching theme, though, nonetheless, with Three Valleys is, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to still maintain it as something that is, is sort of Zinfandel themed in the sense that it has some nice fruit, it's relatively forward, um, you know, and it's, it's, it's a great sort of, for people who've never had Ridge uh, Zinfandel before, it's a great introductory wine. So. Yeah. I mean, that's an important thing that we, we need to always realize is that this is our largest volume wine, even if it's not a single vineyard wine, this is more likely than not going to be people's first contact with Ridge. So yeah, even if it's not a single vineyard wine, it still has to taste like Ridge, right, John? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we're, 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 you know, it's, it's not like we're, we're uh, in terms of, in terms of the fermentation and how we treat the wine, um, barrel aging, it's, it's getting all the same, uh, all the same treatment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Single barrel handling, wild yeast ferments, it's all, all made the same way. It's just, right. it's more of an assembled wine than a single vineyard. Exactly. David Gates, uh, this is the first of four 2020 wines that are, you know, Zinfandel or Zinfandel based. And obviously there's a lot of interest around the 2020 vintage, particularly in the trade regarding the wildfires that year. Uh, and I think for the most part, consumers have forgotten about it. I, I really kind of have that sense. I mean, there's been so much going on in their lives between COVID and everything else that I think they forgot about wildfires in California. But the trade, trade remembers and particularly as retailers realize they're not going to get their Montalena this year because Montalena didn't make any wine. It's going to be a sort of a constant reminder that this was a somewhat different vintage. But, you know, talk about our process in terms of going through and, 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 and making wines in 2020 and, and how, you know, how different that was. Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a year that I, it would be nice not to repeat <laughs> anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had uh, multiple fires on. We had two fires at Montebello, one on to the south and one to the north and and east of us. We had two fires at Lytton Springs, one on our back door in Dry Creek, in the upper reaches of Dry Creek, and the other that um, that was in kind of the Geyser slash Berryessa, and and that was before the the um, the second fire of the season that hit, um, and that. So it's, it's a phenomena that, that does happen in the West Coast. It's dry lightning. We get these systems that come in. Um, the, in the best sense, they will bring rain with them along with the lightning, but, or they come after harvest. It's really rare and hopefully not a harbinger of, of the future that, they, that this one hit in middle of August. So really before we had started doing any harvest at all or very little. Um, Smoke is a funny thing, um, the the way it the way it settles and and um, and the way it affects grapes. And so you you can test for it, but the best test for it is um, is making the wine and and trying it, tasting it. Um, there's a you have enzymes in your in your mouth um, in your saliva that actually release these bound smoke particles that are bound up in the sugars, um, uh, the complex sugars in the in the wines and. And that's, that's how you can tell. So you basically have to stay away from anything that was directly in the smoke or, um, or that once you've made the wine, if you think that it you know, was far enough away from the smoke um, that, that it could make, it, make um, good wine, then you taste it and see. And I would um, give us an, a really good example of that would be um, all of our vineyards in Alexander Valley. They were surrounded by fires, but the way the wind was blowing it, it, the smoke really didn't settle into Alexander Valley until it was several days old and, and didn't really affect in any of the vineyards in Alexander Valley. So we got really lucky. Um, there, Montebello and Lytton, it was more of a, what's the exposure? Um, how did the wines turn out? So, and, and I'm sure, you know, we could, 
we could spend a long time talking about that. Um, but I think that our, our approach was we had some wines that, that we knew right away were very good and we didn't have to worry about them. We had other wines that uh, some that we didn't even pick, some grapes that we didn't even pick that we knew were going to be affected. So we, they, we didn't bother with them very much. But then there's this group of wines in the middle that we knew it had some exposure to smoke. Um, the wines tasted really good, but we had to wait and see what, how, they would, uh, how they would turn out. And you know, the good thing that we found out is, is Zinfandel can take quite a bit of smoke exposure before it, before it really affects it. Um, Petit Verdot can't, which is really crazy because Petit Verdot has got all these tannins that Zinfandel doesn't have. But uh, so, and it's, it's very much an indus of industry concern. The Australians have been de dealing with this for at least 10 years. Um, California and the West and, and um, Washington, Oregon, are just now really starting to delve into it. Um, look as far as um, research goes, um, but you know the the best the best way to to tell if it's been affected is tasted in the glass. So that's yeah. kind of our that's been our approach. And um, yeah, yeah, John. Thanks. I mean, pardon the pun, but really, this was trial and fire uh, in 2020 in terms of we hadn't really had an experience like this with fires at the beginning of harvest rather than at the tail end. Uh, and I mean, it was, uh, I mean, I think you and your team were just learning through a fire hose about how to deal with this, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was certainly, you know, it, it was high anxiety, you know, um, it was really, uh, and I, I think one of the things that was so frustrating is that, um, like David mentioned that, you know, um, there's a lot of regions around the world who have, who have dealt with this and gone through it and had that experience. But this was really the first time um, for us in, in Northern California. Um, you know, we, we see <clears throat> forest fires um, almost every, every year at the very end of autumn. But this is one that started in August. So that was really the, that was, you know, that was the game changer. And, you know, in the end, um, we were all just, you know, at the mercy of, of, of the wind, because it was really, you know, where's, where is it, um, where's the fire, where's the smoke going to be carried? Um, and we were, you know, overall, we were very fortunate. Um, like David said, there were a few of our outside growers where we didn't pick the grapes. Um, and we did declassify um, some wines that were sort of, you know, kind of slightly affected, but, um, you know, overall, uh, it was less than 10% of, uh, of all of our wine. So yeah. we, we were we were lucky. I, I would say that, that this moment is probably the biggest task we've had for this wine. We literally have, you know, roughly 800 people with us tasting these wines right now live. I know we've been tasting these wines constantly for weeks and months, and we have a lot of confidence in it. But um, clearly, we would not be releasing these wines uh, uh, to the public and to the trade, if we didn't have, you know, ultimate confidence in in their uh, in their quality, right? Yeah, yeah. So very good. So why don't we move to the third wine, which is the Pastel Robles, uh, 2020 Zinfandel. And David, uh, maybe I'll ask you to kick this off. This is a wine we've been making up for a very long time, and uh, has a very distinctive history with Ridge. Yeah, this uh, this is a uh, pre Paul Draper wine. Uh, David Benyon, <laughs> our, our first winemaker, um, uh, bought bought some grapes from Benny Ducey, Benito Ducey down in Paso Robles, who at that time still had his own little winery. Um, and then we we came back um, after Paul joined Ridge in in 1976, and we've been making the wine every year since. Um, it's a it's a beautiful location. Um, really uh, beautiful vines. It's just south of the town of Paso Robles. Um, as the 30 plus years that I've been at Ridge, I've watched a whole development go across the freeway and a, a cement plant that has always been there expanded to the south of it and then a big garden center and, and a, a brewery grow into the north of it. So it's kind of this beautiful little vineyard up against the river surrounded by the freeway and, 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 and industry. And it makes the best wine. Um, so um, Benny passed away in 2020, and his um, his brother Dante, who uh, 
uh, was 10 years older than him, they kind of had this running competition because they kind of inherited the two larger parcels from their parents. And um, Benny never married. So he was able to keep his vineyard and he made some wine too on the side as, as a little winery. So he was able to make enough money to, um, to keep it. But in, in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, when you couldn't really get much money for grapes, Dante had a growing family. And, um, and so he actually pulled out most of his Zinfandel vines. Um, he saved a little bit that, that um, Turley gets actually, and uh, planted wheat because that was a cash crop and his, um, and, and, uh, and then, and then eventually as they, as grapes became a little bit more popular again, <clears throat> he replanted and Benny has never, never let him forget it. Every time I'd see them, they were always going after, you know, who had the best grapes and Benny always said, well, I do cause they're older. But um, uh, the last few years now, um, uh, Mike Ducey, Dante's son, um, who has his own um, empire of, uh, of vineyards and um, and wineries that he sells to has been taking care of the, of the vineyard and it's it's been a seamless uh, seamless transition. Uh, Mike had been uh, starting in about 2017 had been helping Benny with the harvest, um, taking over the harvest from Benny, and um, and and it's just been it's marvelous. The the Ducey family's uh, well respected. Janelle makes wine, one of Mike's uh, children, and um, and they're doing a, a great job. And it's. To me, it's like it's. I think it's the first time that um, anyone labeled a winery or a, a wine Paso Robles. They've kind of put Paso Robles on the map as far as Zinfandel goes, even though they've been making it for a long time. And it's it's this quintessential uh, Paso Robles Zin, right? So it's this vi vi vibrant, beautiful fruit that just kind of fills up your mouth. And then it's got this nice acid, but the tannins are velvety smooth, even when it's young like this. And it just kind of slides down your, yeah. your mouth and it, it's, it's been great. Um, yeah, it's, uh, we, we love it. It's super easy that um, it gets ripe uh, early, typically. And um, we pick probably 80% of the vineyard in like three or four days. And then we wait a week or so for the last little bit of it. And it's just, it's great. It's a, it's a pleasure and a treasure to fun, very fun to work with. That's exactly what I'm seeing in glass right now. This is a ready to drink early drinking Zen. It's just all pleasure. And it's really, really, really phenomenal. It's S20 vintage is super. John, what, what's your experience now working with, with Paso and Paso grapes in DC? Well, yeah, like, I mean, I, like David said, it, it's quintessential Zinfandel. I mean, if, if, if you had, you know, if, if, if you want to introduce someone to Zinfandel and get them hooked, mm -hmm. open Paso Robles. Um, it's a beautiful vineyard. Um, and it, 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 it's incredible. Just the, you know, Zinfandel is, is, is a, is a grape that generally has a lot of fruit to it. But it's really, um, you know, it's it's really done with an exclamation point um, at Paso. It's just this beautiful sort of cornucopia of fruit, and you know, the other um, thing that you know, you get that sort of big hit of fruit, but the texture of the wine is is really amazing. I mean, yeah. it just has this, you know, David mentions the velvety, the sort of softness that's so uh, inviting, and on top of that, despite it being a very warm region, there's great acidity. So, it, you know, it's the best of all worlds for Zinfandel. Um, yeah. We, 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 this, we saw some photos of this vineyard, David, early, you know, uh, just early on here. And it's, it's an old, old vine vineyard, head trained, what, you know, rumored to be the oldest vineyard in Paso. Um, what, uh, what is the vineyard composition? <clears throat> Is it own rooted? I know it's sandy soil. What is a little bit about the, the what makes this vineyard so unique? Yeah, so so it's not the oldest vineyard in, in Paso, the uh, Uberoth, and there's another one. I always forget the name. I'm sorry. Anyway, they are older. Uh, the oldest vines here at, at, at Benny's Vineyard were planted in 1922, 1923, so right in the middle of Prohibition. Um, and they were own rooted. So starting about oh, way before I joined Ridge, probably 20 years before I joined, so 50 years ago, there were some sections with a little more clay where the vines started to die from phylloxera. So 
over the last 50 years, um, Benny and now Mike uh, have been slowly replanting uh, on rootstock. So some of the replants are 50 years old, um, but they would be 100 vines at a time, 50 vines one year, 200 vines every three years, something like that, just as, the, as these little pockets of phloxera would, would weaken the vine. So of the, it's a 24 acre vineyard. There are probably about five acres left on the southern end that are the old um, own rooted vines. And then, and the rest of them, like I say, are, I'd say the majority of those replants are 30 plus years old now. And um, it's almost all zen. You go to the oldest vines and you'll see a, 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 an old Grenache vine here and there, an old Carignan vine here and there. Benny, put in a, oh, maybe a couple hundred Petit Syrah and Alicante vines as he was doing replantings. And, um, and so, but, so we call it 100% Zen, it's 99.9% you know, Zen, but there are, a, is a little bit of this and that, you know. Um, we're we're going to have to go out and map that vineyard one day, it sounds yeah. like. <laughs> yes, that, that would be fun. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's old school the way it's planted, it's 10 by 10. Uh, it's cross disc and um, and it's it's dry farmed in the summer. They do have a well and they sprinkle irrigate in the winter. So, for instance, in in 2020, they um, had a total of eight inches of rain. So in February, they put another two or three inches of rain on, and that was enough to get it through to harvest. So that that's kind of how how yeah. they've been doing it. I mean, less rainfall there on average. So those are very deep rooted vines and really able to figure out how to survive in that environment at this point, right? Ab absolutely. It's, so it's all alluvium uh, from the Salinas River and that alluvium has a lot of limestone in it that's been washed down from the hills. And it's, it's a, uh, the Paso limestone is very different from Montebello limestone. It's like a hundred million years younger. It's only like 40 million years old or something. It's got fossils in it. And, um, you know, of whales and, and other fish and stuff. And so that really helps sweeten the soil. It's all about, um, you know, that how, how good the grapes like that soil and that it's, it's, uh, it's beautiful stuff. Awesome. Well, good. Well, now we have the great opportunity of trying another virtually 100% Zinfandel side by side from a completely different appellation, uh, East Bend. So John, I know this is right out your back door there. So why, why don't I ask you to kick this off? Sure. Um, yeah, so yeah, this is, it's a real treat to be able to just taste them side by side because they really are, <clears throat> I mean, of course, they're, they're the same in being 100% uh, Zinfandel, but um, they're really, you know, they really reflect uh, the different places where they're grown. So East Bench, you know, we're right here in, in the heart of Dry Creek Valley. Um, and the, the expression of the Zinfandel um, in general, I would say, but certainly from this vineyard, um, you know, we sort of move over into to fruit that's a, a little more uh, on, on the darker side, more you know, towards blackberries. Um, and I think one of the, the key differences, too, is that even though uh, the East Bench is uh, certainly compared to Paso Robles, um, a much younger vineyard, uh, the vines are just a little over 20 years old. Um, it's, it's a wine that has, uh, there's a little more tannic grip to it. There's a little more structure there. So it's a different, it's a different mouthfeel. Um, and, and, you know, and actually something as well, because of that, that, uh, I think, you know, it's delicious. It's a fun wine to drink in its youth, but, you know, after five, six, seven years, um, it really does start to evolve into, uh, and develop some, um, some real complexity. Yeah, we're looking at some photos now of the of the soil there, David Gates, that iron red soil that's really distinctive and, and different from Linton Springs, which which it abuts, right? Yes, up on the on the bench lands at <clears throat> at Dry Creek and at Lytton, uh, we have this uh, red red loamy soil. It's called sites. Um, it's typically a, a slope soil. It's it's actually an old seabed or or uh, I would say seabed that but pretty old, like 80 million years old. So um, geologic terms, not that old, but for us, very old. Um, there are little round rocks in there. So it was laid down at some point when the oceans were much higher than they are now that um, kind of pushed the headwaters up um, fur further up so that this heavier soil loamy and clay um, was able to settle. Then it lifted as Dry Creek cut, cut it out from, um, cut the, uh, 
uh, its valley out, it was left up on, on the high side. It's red because it has a lot of iron in it. Anytime you see iron, like at Montebello, we have some red soils that high iron content. Um, it's uh, before we planted in, in 2000, 2001, it had been fallow since uh, probably just after prohibition. So it had vineyards on it in the past. Uh, but in the, la in the intervening years, it was just pasture land. So it has really good organic matter. Um, the vines are very, very um, prolific, especially in their youth. Um, and uh, they've settled down now being over 20 years old. And, um, and I'm, I'm just amazed at how this wine has changed. I think our first East Bench was in 04 or 05. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it was beautiful, but it was nowhere near as complex as this wine has become over the years. And it's, yeah. I mean, to say that that's 100% Zin is, is pretty, pretty impressive. And it's, um, yeah, I, I love it. I, it's like a, what would you say, an iron fist and a velvet glove, something yeah. like that, right? So it's got yeah. those tannins that be, um, it will be better in a year or two, definitely. It will, it will um, soften up, um, and even though it's just gorgeous now, but you might want to double decant it or something or if you want to drink it right away. It really is amazing for 100% Zinfandel to how much structure this wine has. It is really impressive. And it's such an interesting contrast to the Paso, which is so velvety and soft. And I mean, to me, John, this is like a great illustration of why Zinfandel is such a um, can transmitter of terroir. I mean, that, that this grape, for some reason here in California, really does probably as well as any variety transmit to Laura. Oh, you're muted, John, sorry. Yeah, no, no question about it. Um, you know, Zinfandel, I, I like to say, you know, Zinfandel uh, in California makes really transparent wines. In other words, you can really kind of tell, uh, you know, where, where, it's, uh, where it's coming from. Um, and, and, and yes, you get that it's Zinfandel and yet, um, it's almost like the, the variety sort of uh, takes, takes the, the back seat um, and, and you're getting much more of an expression of, uh, of the soil and the microclimate where it's being grown. Yeah, it's really, I mean, this is a, a textbook ex exercise that I wish more people would be able to go through to really understand this because this is a, such a key example right, right in front of us. Well, good. Well, the, the bad news on East Bench is that it's very limited in terms of availability. The 2020 was not kind to us in terms of quantity. So we we're certainly hoping for some bounce back years in 22 and 23, but 20 was, it's a little tight. And I think most of you are already aware of that. So let's move to the next wine, which whose availability is pretty much normal because it's in Alexander Valley in 2020. And David Gates booked to this. And David, why don't you kick off the 2020 guys ago, obviously this is, you know, beyond technicalities, probably the Zinfandel we've been making longer than any other. Uh, and, uh, and talk a little bit about this vineyard site and what makes it so unique. Yes, this, this wine we've been making uh, every year since 1966. It's, uh, it's in Alexander Valley. It's on the western edge of Alexander Valley. Uh, just south of the town of Geyserville. It's really only, it's only about a mile and a half from our winery at Lytton Springs. It's um, this, there's a beautiful little stretch of um, land that runs right alongside, most of it under the freeway, <laughs> uh, right, right alongside 101 that has um, this, uh, it's rocky alluvium from Dry Creek that was laid down eons ago. It's very deep and very rocky, the, the, um, the gravelly, I should say, the, the, it's all river rock. The deeper you go in the soil, the more rock there is. The water table there, because of the hills to the west and the river to the east is, is fairly high in the spring, but it's, it, the soil is, it drains quite well. So the vines um, it tend to be very deeply rooted and they follow the wine or the, they follow the water down um, as the as the spring uh, summer dries out, as the soil dries out in the spring and summer, and they just they grow beautifully. It's it's kind of um, there's a there's a little saying in the in the or an adage I would say in the wine business that when you're making wine, the the very best wines you don't need to intervene very much on. They kind of become balanced as they are. They have enough tannin, they have enough acid, they have enough fruit. The, the, I would say the same thing with Geyserville. These vines, we, we just do the minimum on and it's good enough because the vines, they grow just enough 
They don't grow too much. They put just enough fruit on. We rarely have to thin. The yields are decent. Even with these old vines, we can sometimes get, you know, three tons an acre. Um, and it, it's just, it, it really, it doesn't farm itself, but it does really well. Um, yeah. The oldest vines we farm are grown here. They were planted in the 1890s. We call it the old patch. It's, uh, it's actually in three sections. Two of them are completely mixed, like 30, 30 plus percent Carignan, 25 or 26 percent Zinfandel, a big slug of Tinturier varieties, like, uh, mostly Alicante Boucher, but there's some beautiful little Petit Boucher vines and some Grand Noir vines in there as well. Then there's a smattering of, um, I would call them uh, more like color slash um, tannin wines, like um, uh, for tannin would be, would be Mat Mataro, which is our the old California name for Movedra or Monastral is what I guess we should all be calling it, right? Um, a little bit of Grenache. There's some Syrah vines, um, Petite Syrah, and it's, uh, its other parent, uh, Pelerson. And then a smorgasbord of other varieties um, that, that are really, were really fun to categorize and look at, including um, one that has just gotten some nice ink, uh, Cabernet Pfeffer, which is actually called Mortal, <clears throat> which um, it's, it grows really well in the Cienega Valley and, um, south of Hollister in California, where they have the most vines of it. But the oldest vines are at the old patch, <laughs> that, mm -hmm. at least that I've seen anyway. Um, and then a couple other crazy ones like St. Macaire and um, a Rose of Peru or Black Prince, which is Listan Prieto number two. So all these really cool varieties <laughs> that, that are just, you know, randomly mixed in the vineyard um, along with the standards. Um, so that's that's why I like it. Um, and, yeah. And it's and it's a great place. It, it gets um, it's more, it's much more uniform than Litton. And there's less clay in the soil, so it does let make for less stress on the vines. And it's um, once they get ripe, it's just pick away. So it, it's it's a fun fun vineyard, and it makes a amazing wine, especially with all the Carignan that's in it. Yeah, you twisted off into geekdom pretty good there, Dave. I appreciate. Yeah, it. thanks. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but but John, from a winemaking perspective, sort of playing off of what David Gates was talking about that a vineyard where it makes itself, where you're not having to interview to acidify or deacidify, and and also maybe talking about the, the consistency of quality over, you know, more than 50 vintages and, and what, what that means and what what does that say about Geyserville? Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly, um, you know, we, we just tried two wines that were 100% Zinfandel and then, you know, so you're, this is really a big shift um, because, you know, as, as David, <clears throat> um, explained, you know, we're, we're talking about a field blend, uh, vineyard here. And, um, you know, for me, there's, it's, it's, uh, as much as I, 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 I adore, you know, the Paso and, and the East Bench for their expression of fruit, I think there's, we're, we're yeah. moving to something that's a little more multi-dimensional here. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you have grapes that are really, uh, you know, that are, they, they come in and, and the acidity and the sugar and just the concentration is, is ideal, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, um, you know, you, 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 you just kind of have to get out of the way and, and, and not muck and fiddle around. I, I like to say that <clears throat> the most difficult thing to do in winemaking is to do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's kind of, you know, to a certain degree, that's, that's, a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times what you have to do, what you have to do with Dr. Bill. And if you have perfect yeah. fruit, then leave it alone. Yeah, it's just amazing that these farmers back in the 1890s, it, you know, how smart they were in terms of delivering today, you know, the acidity coming from the Kerrigan and the rocky soil, you don't have to acidify and just coming in in perfect balance, you know, with, you know, these 20, five plus different varieties coming together into the blend that are co-fermenting. So we have a lot of thanks to give to these, uh, these farmers that, that we're really benefiting from their, um, their work and their intelligence, you know, a long time ago. No, I think no, no question about it. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I <clears throat> yeah, I often think about that. I mean, it, it's hard to imagine that um, had, had it not already been there, 
you know, in other words, had, had someone not already taken um, you know, planted the vineyard that way, that that anyone would 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 have approached it that way. You know, yeah. would have would have planted it in such a uh, a what appears on the surface to be a completely random array of great <laughs> but what in fact there's there's a method to the madness. Absolutely. And and David, to that point, even we sort of succumb to that a little bit. If you go back 25, 30 years, if Ridge was replanting, we were planting solid blocks as Infidel and Petit Sura. We were not interplanting, but we kind of we kind of succumb to the fact that these guys were smarter than us back in the 1890s, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, um, you know, you kind of look at that and, and when, so we leased the Witten Ranch in, in, in 1990, uh, 1990, before we um, were able to buy it in 2015. And so, and we were, we were able to actually lease it because uh, from the Trentadues because they couldn't afford to replant about half of the 30 acres that had uh, Chenin Blanc and French Columbard and some really virus Merlot. So when we replanted that, we, we did. We did um, some of our best uh, clones of Zinfandel and then a couple blocks of Petit Sera and one block of Mataro. Um, it wasn't until 2000 that we started to um, play around with field blending. And, um, and that's in, in an adjacent uh, property called the Fredson Ranch, where I, we kind of did about 50% Zen and then um, mostly Carignan and, and Petit Sera, but then a smorgasbord of other varieties. And that wine was different from the single varietal wine or vineyards that we had planted, where when they're young, sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. They, um, in, in the main wine, right? Um, as they get older, they make it more often uh, because that's when the soil kind of takes over and the vines find their place. This block of, of mixed plantings, it made it the first year and it's made it every year since. So uh, that was an eye opener. And then ever since we, um, as we've had blocks come in for replanting or planting at Lytton Springs, we've been doing that same thing, doing mixed, mixed plantings. So it's a, it's, a, it's a really good way to go field blends, we call it. And um, yeah. it helps. There's a synergy that, that goes together with, um, with that, that you can kind of adapt it to make a wine that you, your, st your style of wine, the wine you wanna make. Very good. So why don't we uh, transition to our final wine, the, the 2019 Estate Cabernet. So back to Montebello, to the second wine uh, of our top wine, Montebello. And um, the good news here, the 19 was a very different vintage than 20. It was a, a large vintage with super high quality. So this is, for a change is a wine that we have good availability on relative to the previous vintages. So that's, that's good news for everyone out in the audience. But John, can you talk a little bit about how this wine is made vis-a-vis -vis Montebello and, um, and how it relates to Montebello? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, I, I, you know, no question about it. 2019 was really it was it was kind of a Goldilocks uh, vintage for us. I mean, it's I don't know. I mean, once every 15 years it seems. Um, you know, we get a uh, a vintage where there you know we had lots of rainfall during the winter. The vines came out at tremendous growth, and they produced you know more grapes than usual. But the quality I think is is outstanding. Um, so yeah, in a lot of ways, like I was ex sort of explaining earlier about the selection process, um, you know, that's part and parcel of what we're, what, you know, how we make, um, the Montebello and, uh, the estate Cabernet. So, um, you know, on the, on the previous map that showed all the different vineyard blocks, um, you know, those also, of course, are subdivided into smaller blocks. Um, and again, we'll have, um, you know, certainly a minimum of 40 different um, <clears throat> parcels that are fermented that we then go through and taste and in any given year and then select those which we think are, you know, most represent and, and are built for long-term aging and that's the Montebello. And then um, other blocks that maybe are just a bit more forward, um, maybe not quite as tannic, of uh, those we then reserve for the estate Cabernet. As a general rule, um, you know, most uh, of the estate Cabernet 
comes from some of the lower elevations of the Klein Vineyard. Um, and, you know, to me, one of the things that I always, uh, that, that, that kind of differentiates the two is, um, you know, for me, the Estate Cabernet, when I go to drink it, I, I, I kind of get that, that I, I can pick it out as the, as the varietal Cabernet, um, and it's, which is great. Um, and there's just a little more fruit presence to the wine. And then when you go to the Montebello, which is coming from the higher elevations, there's a, a bit more of an austerity to it. Um, and I really, the, the varietal, again, kind of takes the back seat. And here you have something um, where, there's, where there's just this tremendous tight-knit structure that you can just tell, um, coupled with the great acidity, is something that, you know, is going to need 30, 35 years to unwind. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good description, John, where there's a little bit, or no, a little bit, there's a lot more tension in the Montebello as a exactly. wine. And this is a little more generous and tasting more of that Cabernet fruit right up front. And that's really the idea. I mean, this is really developed to be an earlier drinking wine for restaurant consumption. And I think it really hits the mark here. It's, I mean, even as youth, it's accessible. The tannins are not too astringent. And it really does hit that mark. Versus Montebello, you you can drink it in its youth, but you really want to give it at least a decade before you, you pull a cork. Um, something, you know, obviously we talk a lot about it, Ridge, about transparency and our ingredient labeling. This is a certain uh, important aspect of that. And on the 19 Estate Cabernet, it doesn't show up every year, but egg whites show up on the 19 Cabernet. So John, can you sort of speak to that and what, what that's all about? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, egg whites are a, uh, you know, age old uh, method for to use for fining um, in which um, the egg whites uh, are mixed into a barrel and as they settle, they pull out um, a lot of uh, more aggressive tannins and they help to soften the wine. And we don't actually fine the entire wine, but frequently um, we'll have some press lots, which were, which we kept aside because they were just so incredibly tannic. Um, and then we'll find those so that we can then include that press wine in with the estate cabernet. So that's, that's kind of where that comes from. Yeah. And David Gates, I, I mean, in my experience, this wine is probably in more demand versus maybe with the exception of Montebello of any wine in our portfolio that it's really has gained a following and people appreciate the, the quality of the wine that the terroir it expresses from the unique Montebello vineyard and you know people want it. So how, how is our planning going in the open space and when can we expect to see some, some more fruit coming online? Well, first, first, I want to acknowledge that you were right 15 years ago, David, <laughs> when you said, yeah, we need more estate cab. We need to change the name and we need more of this. So, yes, they're, they're coming along. We, we planted another an additional seven and a half acres last year. Um, in addition to the nine and a half acres that we had planted, um, these are all additional acres um, right next to Peroni. Um, that were due to our uh, exchange with the uh, Mid-Peninsula open space of many years in the making that happened in 2015. Um, the, that's the good news. The, the bad news is the drought has affected us. So we didn't have enough water to give the, these vines. And so the, the upper gate block, the nine and a half acres that we planted in 2019, um, that's finally going to come on this year pretty good, pretty well. I think we, we should get about a half of a crop off of it. So uh, in Valley standards, we should be at full production by now, but we're not in the Valley. Um, um, the other, the seven and a half, half acres that we planted last year, um, we'll bud some of that this year so, and some of it will bud next year. And that's a direct um, result of the drought, last year's drought. So it's, it's coming along, but it's slow, right? So you, you plant the vineyard, and, um, and say four years after you planted, you get your first fruit. Well, it's a red wine. So it's gonna be three years before you actually see that wine in the marketplace. So you're, it's a long-term investment. It's, um, 
you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. What did they say? The best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago and the second best time is today, right? So at least exactly. it's at least it's planted. Yes. <laughs> it's <coming. Yes. laughs> exactly. Well, I, I uh, thank you very much, David Gates. Thank you, John, only for your time today and for your expertise. We really appreciate it. I see that we're at the top of the hour and I'm conscious of everyone's time. Uh, happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. Good luck with the spring releases. Go out there, do a great job, make some great placements. Hopefully this tasting has been helpful for you. And uh, thanks again for your time and participation. And we um, greatly look forward to seeing you in the fall for our fall virtual tasting. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Appreciate it. Bye.